The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued. Secularization took another step when Corinthianus, in 280, began the first known public instruction in Roman law. From that time onward, the lawyer replaced the priest and dominated the mind and life of Rome. Soon the tables were made the basis of education. Till Cicero's day, all schoolboys had to learn them by heart, and doubtless they had a share in forming the stern and orderly, litigious and legalistic Roman soul. Amended and supplemented again and again by legislation, praetorial edicts, senatus consulta, and imperial decrees, the Twelve Tables remained for nine hundred years the basic law of Rome. The law of procedure was already complex in this code. Almost any magistrate might act as a judge, but the praetors were the usual court, and their revisions and interpretations of the statutes kept Roman law a living growth instead of a corpse of precedence. Every year the praetor urbanus, or chief city magistrate, drew up a list or white tablet, album, of senators and equites eligible for jury service. The presiding judge in an action chose jurors from this list, subject to a limited number of rejections by plaintiff and defendant. Lawyers were permitted to advise clients and plead in court, and some senators gave legal advice in public sittings or at home. The law of Cincius in 204 BC forbade taking pay for legal services, but legal skill found ways of circumventing this counsel of perfection. Slaves were often tortured to elicit evidence. The Twelve Tables constituted one of the severest codes in history. They retained the old paternal omnipotence of a military agricultural society, allowed the father to scourge, chain, imprison, sell, or kill any of his children, merely adding that a son thrice sold was thereafter free from his father's rule. Class division was preserved by forbidding the marriage of a patrician with a plebeian. Creditors received every right against debtors. Owners could dispose freely of their property by will. Property rights were held so sacred that a thief caught in the act was given as a slave to the man whom he had robbed. Penalties ranged from simple fines to exile, enslavement, or death. Several took the form of equivalent retaliation, lex talionis. Many were fines delicately adjusted to the rank of the victim. For breaking the bones of a freeman, three hundred asses. Of a slave, one hundred fifty asses. Death was decreed for libel, bribery, perjury, harvest thieving, nocturnal damage to a neighbor's crops, the defrauding of a client by a patron, practicing enchantments, arson, murder, and seditious gatherings in the city by night. The parricide was tied in a sack, sometimes with a cock, a dog, a monkey, or a viper, and cast into the river. Within the capital, however, appeal from any but a dictator's sentence of death could be taken by a citizen to the assembly of the centuries. And if the accused perceived that the vote there was going against him, he was free to commute his sentence into exile by leaving Rome. Consequently, despite the severity of the Twelve Tables, capital punishment of freemen was rare in Republican Rome. 4. The Army of the Republic the Roman Constitution rested finally on the most successful military organization in history. The citizens and the army were one. The army, assembled in its centuries, was the chief law-making body in the state. The first eighteen centuries supplied the cavalry. The first class formed the heavy infantry, armed with two spears, a dagger, and a sword, and protected by bronze helmet, cuirass, greaves, and shield. The second class had all of these except the cuirass. The third and fourth had no armor, the fifth had only slings and stones. A legion was a mixed brigade of some 4,200 infantry, 300 cavalry, and various auxiliary groups. Two legions made a consul's army. Each legion was subdivided into centuries, originally of 100, later of 200 men, commanded by centurions. Every legion had its vexillum, its banner or colors, Honor forbade that this should ever fall into hostile hands, and clever officers sometimes threw it into the enemy's ranks to stir their men to a desperate recovery. In battle, the front ranks of the infantry hurled at the foe ten to twenty paces away a volley of javelins, short wooden lances with an iron point, while on the wings archers and slingers attacked with arrows and stones, and the cavalry charged with pikes and swords. Hand-to-hand -hand combats with short swords were the final and decisive action. In a siege, massive wooden catapults, worked by tension or torsion, hurled ten-pound rocks over three hundred yards. Immense battering rams, suspended on ropes, were drawn back like a swing and then released against the enemy's walls. 
An inclined ramp of earth and timber was built, wheeled towers were pushed and hauled up this ramp, and from these towers missiles were discharged upon the foe. Instead of the solid and unwieldy phalanx, six lines of five hundred men each, which the early republic seems to have taken over from Etruria, the legion was rearranged, about 366 B.C., into maniples of two centuries each. Free room was left between each maniple and its neighbors, and the maniples of each succeeding line stood behind those open spaces. This formation made possible a rapid reinforcement of one line by the next, and a quick veering of one or more maniples to face a flank attack and it gave quick play to that individual combat for which the Roman soldier was especially trained. The major element in the success of this army was discipline. The young Roman was educated for war from his childhood. He studied the military art above all others, and spent ten formative years of his life in field or camp. Cowardice was in that army the unforgivable sin, punished by flogging the offender to death. The general was empowered to behead any soldier or officer, not merely for flight from battle, but for any deviation from orders, however favorable the result. Deserters or thieves had their right hands cut off. Food in camp was simple. Bread or porridge, some vegetables, sour wine, rarely flesh. The Roman army conquered the world on a vegetarian diet. Caesar's troops complained when corn ran out and they had to eat meat. Labor was so arduous and long that the soldiers begged for battle instead— Valor became the better part of discretion. The soldier received no pay till 405 B.C. and little thereafter, but he was allowed to share, according to his rank, in the booty of the defeated, bullion and currency, lands and men and movable goods. Such training made not only brave and eager warriors, but able and intrepid generals. The discipline of obedience developed the capacity to command. The army of the Republic lost battles, but it never lost a war. Men molded by stoic education and brutal spectacles to a contemptuous familiarity with death carved out the victories that conquered Italy, then Carthage and Greece, and then the Mediterranean world. Such in outline was the mixed constitution that Polybius admired as the best of all existing governments, a limited democracy in the legislative sovereignty of the assemblies, an aristocracy in the leadership of the patrician senate, a Spartan diarchy in the brief royalty of the consuls, a monarchy in occasional dictatorships. Essentially, it was an aristocracy in which old and rich families, through ability and privilege, held office for hundreds of years and gave to Roman policy a tenacious continuity that was the secret of its accomplishments. But it had its faults. It was a clumsy confusion of checks and balances in which nearly every command could in time of peace be nullified by an equal and opposite command. The division of power was an aid to liberty and, for a while, a restraint on malfeasance. On the other hand, it led to great military disasters like Cannae, it dissolved democracy into mob rule, and at last brought on the permanent dictatorship of the Principate. What astonishes us is that such a government could last so long, 508 to 49 B.C., and achieve so much. Perhaps it endured because of its muddling adaptability to change, and the proud patriotism formed in the home, the school, the temple, the army, the assembly, and the senate. Devotion to the state marked the zenith of the republic, as unparalleled political corruption marked its fall. Rome remained great as long as she had enemies who forced her to unity, vision, and heroism. When she had overcome them all, she flourished for a moment, and then began to die. 3. The Conquest of Italy Never had Rome been so encompassed by enemies as when she emerged from the monarchy as a weak city-state, ruling only 350 square miles, equivalent to a space 19 by 19 miles. While Lars Porsena advanced upon her, many of the neighboring communities that had been subjected by her kings resumed their liberty and formed a Latin league to withstand Rome. Italy was a medley of independent tribes or cities, each with its own government and dialect. In the north, the Ligures, Gauls, Umbrians, Etruscans, and Sabines. To the south, the Latins, Volscians, Samnites, Lucanians, Brutians. Along the western and southern coasts, Greek colonists in Cumae, Naples, Pompeii, Pestum, Locri, Regium, Crotona, Metapontum, Tarentum. Rome was at the center of them all, strategically placed for expansion, but perilously open to attack from all sides at once. It was her salvation that her enemies seldom united against her. In 505, while she was at war with the Sabines, a powerful Sabine clan, the Claudian Gents, came over to Rome and was granted citizenship on favorable terms. In 449, the Sabines were defeated. 
By 290, all their territory was annexed to Rome, and by 250, they had received the full Roman franchise. In 496, the Tarquins persuaded some of the towns of Latium, Tusculum, Ardea, Lanuvium, Aricia, Tiber, and others, to join in a war against Rome. Faced with this apparently overwhelming combination, the Romans appointed their first dictator, Aulus Postumius. At Lake Regillus, they won a saving victory, helped, they assure us, by the gods Castor and Pollux, who left Olympus to fight in their ranks. Three years later, Rome signed a treaty with the Latin League in which all parties pledged that, between the Romans and the cities of the Latins, there shall be peace as long as heaven and earth shall last. Both shall share equally in all booty taken in a common war. Rome became a member of the League, then its leader, then its master. In 493, she fought the Volscians. It was in this conflict that Caius Martius won the name of Coriolanus by capturing Corioli, the Volscian capital. The historians add, probably with a touch of romance, that Coriolanus became a hard reactionary, was banished on the insistence of the plebs in 491, fled to the Volscians, reorganized them, and led them in a siege of Rome. The starving Romans, we are told, sent embassy after embassy to dissuade him, to no avail, until his mother and wife went out to him and, failing in their pleas, threatened to block his advance with their bodies. Thereupon he withdrew his army and was killed by the Volscians, or, says another story, he lived among them to a bitter ripe old age. In 405, Vei and Rome entered upon a duel to the death for the control of the Tiber. Rome besieged the city for nine years without success, and the emboldened towns of Etruria joined in the war. Attacked on every side, and their very existence challenged, the Romans appointed a dictator, Camillus, who raised a new army, captured Vei, and divided its lands among the citizens of Rome. In 351, after sundry further wars, southern Etruria was annexed to Rome under the almost modern name of Tuscia. Meanwhile, in 390, a new and greater peril appeared, and that long duel had begun between Rome and Gaul, which ended only with Caesar. While Etruria and Rome were fighting fourteen wars, Celtic tribes from Gaul and Germany had filtered down through the Alps and settled in Italy as far south as the Po. Ancient historians called the invaders Celti or Celti, Galati or Galli, indifferently. Nothing is known of their origin— we may only describe them as that branch of the Indo-European stock which peopled western Germany, Gaul, central Spain, Belgium, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, and formed the pre-Roman languages there. Polybius pictures them as tall and handsome, relishing war and fighting naked except for golden amulets and chains. When the Celts of southern Gaul tasted Italian wine, they were so pleased with it that they decided to visit the land that produced such transporting fruit. Probably they were moved more by the quest for fresh acres and new pasturage. Entering, they lived for a time in abnormal peace, tilling and herding, and taking over the Etruscan culture which they found in the towns. About 400 B.C. they invaded and plundered Etruria. The Etruscans resisted weakly, having sent most of their forces to defend Vei against Rome. In 391, 30,000 Gauls reached Clusium. A year later they met the Romans at the river Alia, routed them, and entered Rome unhindered. They sacked and burned large sections of the city, and for seven months besieged the remnants of the Roman army on the capital, the crest of the Capitoline Hill. Finally, the Romans yielded and paid the Gauls a thousand pounds of gold to depart. They left, but returned in 367, 358, and 350. Repeatedly repulsed, they at last contented themselves with northern Italy, which now became Cisalpine Gaul. The surviving Romans found their city so devastated that many of them wished to abandon the site and make Vei their capital. Camillus dissuaded them, and the government provided financial aid for rebuilding homes. This rapid reconstruction in the face of many enemies was a part cause of Rome's designlessness and the venturesome crookedness of her narrow streets. The subject peoples, seeing her so near destruction, revolted again and again, and half a century of intermittent war was required to cure their lust for freedom. The Latins, Equi, Hernesi, and Volscians attacked in turn or together— if the Volscians had succeeded, they would have shut off Rome from southern Italy and the sea, and perhaps have put an end to her history. In 340, the cities of the Latin League were defeated. Two years later, Rome dissolved the League and annexed nearly all Latium. Meanwhile, the victories of Rome over the Volscians had brought her face to face with the powerful Samnite tribes. These held a large cross-section of Italy from Naples to the Adriatic, with such rich cities as Nola, Beneventum, Cumi, and Capua. They had absorbed most of the Etruscan and Greek settlements of the West Coast and enough of Hellenism to produce a distinctive Campanian art. 
Probably they were more civilized than the Romans. With them, Rome fought three long and bloody wars for the control of Italy. At the Caudine Forks, in 321, the Romans suffered one of their greatest defeats, and their beaten army passed under the yoke, an arch of hostile spears, in token of submission. The consuls at the front signed an abject peace, which the Senate refused to ratify. The Samnites won the Etruscans and Gauls as allies, and for a time Rome faced nearly all Italy in arms. But the legions gained a decisive victory at Sentinum in 295, and Rome added Campania and Umbria to her domain. Twelve years later, she drove the Gauls back beyond the Po and again reduced Etruria to a subject state. Between the Gallic North and the Greek South, Rome was now master of Italy. Insatiate and insecure, she offered the cities of Magna Graecia a choice between alliance under Roman hegemony and war, preferring Rome to further absorption by the barbarian, that is, Italian, tribes who were multiplying around and within them, Thurii, Locri, and Crotona consented. Probably they too, like the towns of Latium, were troubled by class war and received Roman garrisons as a protection of property owners against a rising plebs. Tarentum was obstinate and called over to her aid Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, this gallant warrior, fevered with memories of Achilles and Alexander, crossed the Adriatic with an Epirote force, defeated the Romans at Heraclea in 280, and gave an adjective to European languages by mourning the costliness of his victory. All the Greek cities of Italy now joined him, and the Lucanians, Brutians, and Samnites declared themselves his allies. He dispatched Cineus to Rome with offers of peace, and freed his two thousand Roman prisoners on their word to return if Rome preferred war. The Senate was about to make terms when old blind Appius Claudius, who had long since retired from public life, had himself carried to the Senate House and demanded that Rome should never make peace with a foreign army on Italian soil. The Senate sent back to Pyrrhus the prisoners whom he had released and resumed the war. The young king won another victory. Then, disgusted with the sloth and cowardice of his allies, he sailed with his depleted army to Sicily. He relieved the Carthaginian siege of Syracuse and drove the Carthaginians from nearly all their possessions on the island. But his imperious rule offended the Sicilian Greeks, who thought they could have freedom without order and courage. They withdrew their support, and Pyrrhus returned to Italy, saying of Sicily, What a prize I leave to be fought for by Carthage and Rome! His army met the Romans at Beneventum, where for the first time he suffered defeat in 275. The light-armed and mobile maniples proved superior to the unwieldy phalanxes, and began a new chapter in military history. Pyrrhus appealed to his Italian allies for new troops— they refused, doubting his fidelity and persistence. He returned to Epirus and died an adventurer's death in Greece. In that same year, 272, Milo betrayed Tarentum to Rome. Soon all the Greek cities yielded, the Samnites sullenly surrendered, and Rome was at last, after two centuries of war, the ruler of Italy. The conquest was quickly consolidated with colonies, some sent out by the Latin League, some by Rome. These colonies served many purposes. They relieved unemployment, the pressure of population upon the means of subsistence, and consequent class strife in Rome. They acted as garrisons or loyal nuclei amid disaffected subjects, provided outposts and outlets for Roman trade, and raised additional food for hungry mouths in the capital. Conquests in Italy were completed with the plough soon after they had been begun by the sword. In these ways, hundreds of Italian towns that still live today received their foundation or their Romanization. The Latin language and culture were spread throughout a peninsula still largely polyglot and barbarous, and Italy was slowly forged into a united state. The first step had been taken in a political synthesis brutal in execution, majestic in result. But in Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and Africa, closing the western Mediterranean to Roman trade and imprisoning Italy in her own seas, stood a power older and richer than Rome. Chapter 3. Hannibal Against Rome 264 to 202 BC. 1. Carthage. Some 1100 years before our era, the inquisitive traders of Phoenicia discovered the mineral wealth of Spain. Soon a fleet of merchant vessels plied between Sidon, Tyre, and Byblus at one end of the Mediterranean, and Tartessus at the mouth of the Guadalquivir on the other. Since such voyages could not then be made without many stops, and the southern shores of the Mediterranean provided the shortest and safest route, the Phoenicians established intermediate posts and trading stations on the African coast at Leptis Magna, now Lebda, Hadramitum, now Sus, Utica, now Utique, Hippodiorytus, now Bizert, Hippo Regius, now Bon, 
and even beyond Gibraltar at Lixus, south of Tangier. The Semitic settlers at these posts married some of the natives and bribed the rest to peace. About 813 BC, a new group of colonists, perhaps from Phoenicia, perhaps from expanding Utica, built their homes upon a promontory ten miles northwest of the modern Tunis. The narrow peninsula could be easily defended, and the land, watered by the Bagradis, now Majerda River, was so fertile that it quickly recovered from repeated devastation. Classic tradition ascribed the founding of the city to Elissa, or Dido, daughter of the king of Tyre. Her husband having been slain by her brother, she had sailed with other adventurous souls to Africa. Her settlement was called Kartadasht, New Town, to distinguish it from Utica. The Greeks transformed the name into Karchadon, the Romans into Carthago. The Latins gave the name Africa to the region around Carthage and Utica, and followed the Greeks in calling its Semitic population Pini, that is, Phoenicians. The sieges of Tyre by Shalmaneser, Nebuchadrezzar, and Alexander drove many wealthy Tyrians to Africa. Most of them went to Carthage and made it a new center of Phoenician trade. Carthage grew in power and splendor as Tyre and Sidon declined. The strengthened city drove the Africa natives farther and farther inland, ceased to pay tribute to them, exacted tribute from them, and used them as slaves and serfs in its homes and fields. Large estates took form, some with 20,000 men. In the hands of the practical Phoenicians, agriculture became a science and an industry, which the Carthaginian Mago summarized in a famous manual. Irrigated with canals, the soil flowered into gardens, cornfields, vineyards, and orchards of olives, pomegranates, pears, cherries, and figs. Horses and cattle, sheep and goats were bred, asses and mules were the beasts of burden, and the elephant was one of many domesticated animals. Urban industry was relatively immature, except for metalwork. The Carthaginians, like their Asiatic forebears, preferred to trade what others made. They led their pack mules east and west and across the Sahara to find elephants, ivory, gold, or slaves. Their immense galleys carried goods to and from a hundred ports between Asia and Britain, for they refused to turn back, like most other mariners, at the Pillars of Hercules. It was presumably they who, about 490 B.C., financed Hanno's voyage of exploration 2,600 miles down the Atlantic coast of Africa, and the voyage of Himilco along the northern shores of Europe. Although their coinage was undistinguished, they were apparently the first to issue the equivalent of a paper currency. Leather strips stamped with signs of value and accepted throughout the Carthaginian realm. Probably it was the rich merchants, rather than the aristocratic landowners, who provided the funds for those armies and navies which transformed Carthage from a trading post into an empire. The African coast, except Utica, was conquered from Cyrenaica to Gibraltar and beyond. Tartessus, Gades, now Cadiz, and other Spanish towns were captured, and Carthage grew wealthy from the gold, silver, iron, and copper of Spain. It took the Balearic Islands and reached out even to Madeira. It conquered Malta, Sardinia, Corsica, and the western half of Sicily. It treated these subject lands with varying degrees of severity, charging them annual tribute, conscripting their population for its army, and strictly controlling their foreign relations and their trade. In return, it gave them military protection, local self-government, and economic stability. We may judge the wealth of these dependencies from the fact that the town of Leptis Minor paid 365 talents, or $1,314,000 a year, into the Carthaginian treasury. The exploitation of this empire and trade made Carthage, in the 3rd century BC, the richest of Mediterranean cities. Tariffs and tribute brought her annually 12,000 talents, twenty times the revenue of Athens at her zenith. The upper classes lived in palaces, wore costly robes, and ate exotic delicacies. The city, crowded with a quarter of a million inhabitants, became famous for its gleaming temples, its public baths, above all for its secure harbors and spacious docks. Each of the 220 docks was faced with two ionic pillars, so that the inner harbor, or Cothon, presented a majestic circle of 440 marble columns. Thence a broad avenue led to the Forum, a colonnaded square adorned with Greek sculpture and containing administrative buildings, commercial offices, law courts, and temples. While the adjoining streets, orientally narrow, teemed with a thousand shops plying a hundred crafts and resounding with bargaining. Houses rose to six stories and often crowded a family into a single room. In the center of the city, providing one of many hints to later builders of Rome, stood a hill or citadel, the Bursa. 
Here were the treasury and the mint, more shrines and colonnades, and the most brilliant of Carthaginian temples, to the great god Eshman. Around the landward side of the city ran a threefold protective wall forty-five feet high, with still higher towers and battlements. Within the wall were accommodations for four thousand horses, three hundred elephants, and twenty thousand men. Outside the walls were the estates of the rich, and beyond these the fields of the poor. The Carthaginians were Semites, akin in blood and features to the ancient Jews. Their language now and then struck a Hebraic note, as when it called the chief magistrates Shofetes, the Hebrew Shofetim, or judges. The men grew beards, but usually shaved the upper lip with bronze razors. Most of them wore a fez or turban, shoes or sandals, and a long, loose gown. But the upper classes adopted the Greek style of dress, dyed their robes with purple, and fringed them with glass beads. The women led for the most part a veiled and secluded life. They could rise to high place in the priesthoods, but otherwise had to be contented with the sovereignty of their charms. Both sexes used jewelry and perfume, and occasionally displayed a ring in the nose. We know little of their morals except from their enemies. Greek and Roman writers described them as heavy eaters and drinkers, loving to gather in dinner clubs, and as loose in their sex relations as they were corrupt in their politics. The treacherous Romans employed fides punica, Carthaginian faith, as a synonym for treachery. Polybius reported that at Carthage nothing that results in profit is regarded as disgraceful. Plutarch denounced the Carthaginians as harsh and gloomy, docile to their rulers, hard to their subjects, running to extremes of cowardice in fear and of savagery in anger, stubborn in decisions, austere and unresponsive to amusement or the graces of life. But Plutarch, though usually fair, was always a Greek, and Polybius was bosom friend of the Scipio who burned Carthage to the ground. The Carthaginians appear at their worst in their religion, which again we know only from their enemies. Their ancestors in Phoenicia had worshipped Baal Moloch and Astarte as personifying the male and female principles in nature, and the sun and moon in the sky. The Carthaginians addressed similar devotions to corresponding deities, Baal Haman and Tanith. Tanith above all aroused their loving piety. They filled her temples with gifts and took her name in their oaths. Third in honor was the god Melkart, key of the city, then Eshman, god of wealth and health, then a host of minor gods, Baals, or lords. Even Dido was worshipped. To Baal Haman in great crises, living children were sacrificed, as many as three hundred in a day. They were placed upon the inclined and outstretched arms of the idol and rolled off into the fire beneath. Their cries were drowned in the noise of trumpets and cymbals. Their mothers were required to look upon the scene without moan or tear, lest they be accused of impiety and lose the credit to them from the god. In time, the rich refused to sacrifice their own children and bought substitutes among the poor, but when Agathocles of Syracuse besieged Carthage, the upper classes, fearing that their subterfuge had offended the god, cast two hundred aristocratic infants into the fire. It should be added that these stories are told us by Diodorus, a Sicilian Greek, who looked with equanimity upon the Greek system of infanticide. It may be that the Carthaginian sacrifice solaced with piety an effort to control the excesses of human fertility. While the Romans destroyed Carthage, they presented the libraries they found there to their African allies. Of these collections, nothing survives except Hanno's record of his voyage and fragments of Mago on husbandry. St. Augustine vaguely assured us that in Carthage there are many things wisely handed down to memory, and Sallust and Juba made use of Carthaginian historians, but we have no native account of Carthage's history. Of its architecture, the Romans left not a stone upon a stone— we are told that its style was a mixture of Phoenician and Greek, that its temples were massive and ornate, that the temple and statue of Baal Haman were plated with gold valued at a thousand talents, and that even the proud Greeks considered Carthage one of the world's most beautiful capitals. The museums of Tunis contain some pieces of sculpture from sarcophagi found in tombs near the site of Carthage. The finest is a strong and graceful figure, perhaps of Tanith, in a manner essentially Greek. Smaller statues, unearthed from Carthaginian graves in the Beliers, are crude and often repulsively grotesque, as if designed to impress children or frighten devils away. The surviving pottery is purely utilitarian, but we know that Carthaginian craftsmen did good work in textiles, jewelry, ivory, ebony, amber, and glass. Any clear picture of Carthaginian government is now beyond our pens. Aristotle praised the constitution of Carthage as, in many respects, superior to all others, 
for a state is proved to be well-ordered when the commons are steadily loyal to the constitution, when no civil conflict worth speaking of has arisen, and when no one has succeeded in making himself dictator. The citizens met occasionally in an assembly empowered to accept or reject, but not to discuss or amend, proposals referred to it by a senate of three hundred elders. The senate, however, was not obliged to submit to the assembly any measures upon which it could itself agree. The people elected the Senate, but open bribery reduced the virtue or danger of this democratic procedure, and replaced an aristocracy of birth with an oligarchy of wealth. From nominations presented by the Senate, the Assembly annually chose two chauffetes to head the judicial and administrative branches of the state. Above all these bodies was a court of 104 judges who, in contravention of the law, held office for life as it was empowered to supervise all administration and to require an accounting from every official at the end of his term, this court acquired, by the time of the Punic Wars, supreme control over every governmental agency and every citizen. The commander of the armies was nominated by the Senate and chosen by the Assembly. He was in a better position than the Roman consul, for his command could be continued as long as the Senate desired. The Roman, however, led against Carthage legions of landowning patriots, whereas the Carthaginian army was a mercenary force of foreign, chiefly Libyan origin, feeling no affection for Carthage but loyal only to its paymaster and occasionally to its general. The Carthaginian navy was without question the most powerful of its time. Five hundred quinqueremes, gaily painted, slim and swift, ably protected Carthaginian colonies, markets, and trade routes. It was the conquest of Sicily by this army and the closing of the western Mediterranean to Roman commerce by this navy that brought on the century-long duel to the death, known to us as the Three Punic Wars. 2. Regulus The two nations had once been friends when one of them was strong enough to dominate the other. In 508 they had made a treaty that recognized the hegemony of Rome over the coast of Latium, but pledged the Romans not to sail the Mediterranean west of Carthage, nor to land in Sardinia or Libya, except for the brief repair or provisioning of ships. It became a common practice among the Carthaginians, says a Greek geographer, to drown any foreign sailor found between Sardinia and Gibraltar. The Greeks of Massalia, now Marseille, had developed a peaceful coastal commerce between southern Gaul and northeastern Spain. Carthage, we are told, warred on this trade piratically, and Massalia was a faithful ally of Rome. We do not know how much of this is war propaganda dignified as history. Now that Rome controlled Italy, she could not feel secure so long as two hostile powers, Greeks and Carthaginians, held Sicily, hardly a mile from the Italian coast. Besides, Sicily was fertile. It might supply half of Italy with grain. Sicily taken, Sardinia and Corsica would of themselves fall into Roman hands. Here was manifest destiny, the natural next step in the expansion of Rome. How to find a Casus Belli About 264 B.C., a band of Samnite mercenaries who called themselves Mamertines, that is, men of Mars, seized the town of Messena on the Sicilian coast nearest to Italy. They slew or expelled the Greek citizens, divided among themselves the women, children, and goods of the victims, and made a living by raiding the Greek cities nearby. Hiero II, dictator of Syracuse, besieged them. A Carthaginian force landed at Messena, drove Hiero back, and took possession of the city. The Mamertines appealed to Rome for help in expelling their saviors. The Senate hesitated, knowing the power and wealth of Carthage, but the rich plebeians who dominated the centurial assembly clamored for war and Sicily. Rome decided that at whatever cost she must keep the Carthaginians from so near and strategic a port. A fleet was fitted out and dispatched under Caius Claudius to rescue the Mamertines. But these had meanwhile been persuaded by the Carthaginians to withdraw their request for Roman aid, and a message from them to this effect reached Claudius at Regium. Ignoring it, he crossed the strait, invited the Carthaginian commander to a conference, imprisoned him, and sent word to the Carthaginian army that he would be killed if they resisted. The mercenaries welcomed so gallant an excuse for avoiding the legions, and Messena fell to Rome. Two heroes were thrown up by this first Punic War. On the Roman side, Regulus, on the Carthaginian, Hamilcar. Perhaps we should add a third and fourth, the Senate and the Roman people. The Senate won higher row of Syracuse to Rome's side and thereby assured supplies for Roman troops in Sicily. It organized the nation with wisdom and resolution and led it to victory through almost overwhelming disasters. 
The citizens provided money, materials, labor, and men to build Rome's first fleet. Three hundred thirty vessels, nearly all quinqueremes, one hundred fifty feet long, each manned by three hundred rowers and one hundred twenty soldiers, and most of them equipped with novel grappling irons and movable gangways for seizing and boarding enemy ships. By these means, naval warfare, unfamiliar to the Romans, could be turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat, in which the legionaries could use all their disciplined skill. This fact, says Polybius, shows us better than anything else how spirited and daring the Romans are when they are determined to do a thing. They had never given thought to a navy, yet when they had once conceived the project, they took it in hand so boldly that before gaining any experience in such matters, they at once engaged the Carthaginians, who for generations had held undisputed command of the sea. Off Echnomus, on the southern coast of Sicily, the hostile fleets, carrying three hundred thousand men, fought the greatest sea battle of antiquity, this in 256. The Romans under Regulus won decisively and sailed on unhindered to Africa. Landing there without careful reconnaissance, they soon met a superior Carthaginian force, which almost annihilated them, and took their reckless consul prisoner. Shortly afterward, the Roman fleet was dashed by a storm against a rocky coast, 284 vessels were wrecked and some 80,000 men were drowned. It was the worst naval calamity in the memory of men. The Romans showed their quality by building 200 new quinqueremes in three months and training 80,000 men to man them. After keeping Regulus a prisoner for five years, his captors allowed him to accompany a Carthaginian embassy sent to Rome to seek peace, but on his promise to return to captivity if the Senate refused the proffered terms. When Regulus heard these, he advised the Senate to reject them and, despite the entreaties of his family and his friends, went back with the embassy to Carthage. There he was tortured to death by being prevented from sleeping. His sons at Rome took two Carthaginian captives of high rank, bound them in a chest studded with spikes, and kept them awake till they died. Neither tale seems credible until we recall the barbarities of our time. 3. Hamilcar of Hamilcar's, Hasdrubal's, and Hannibal's, Carthage had an abundance, for these names were given in almost every generation in their oldest families. They were pious names, formed from those of the gods. Hamilcar was, He whom Melkart protects. Hasdrubal was, He whose help is Baal. Hannibal was, The very grace of Baal. Our present Hamilcar was surnamed Barca, Lightning. It was his nature to strike swiftly, suddenly, anywhere. He was still a youth when, in 247, Carthage gave him supreme command of its forces. Taking a small fleet, he harassed the coast of Italy with surprise landings, destroying Roman outposts and taking many prisoners. Then, in the face of a Roman army holding Panormus, now Palermo, he disembarked his troops and captured a height overlooking the town. His contingent was too small to risk a major engagement, but every time he led it forth it returned with spoils. He begged the Carthaginian Senate for reinforcements and supplies. It refused, hugged its hordes, and bade him feed and clothe his soldiers in the country that surrounded him. Meanwhile, the Roman fleet had won another victory, but had suffered a serious defeat at Trapana in 249. Worn out almost equally, the two nations rested for nine years. But while in those years Carthage did nothing, relying upon the genius of Hamilcar, a number of Roman citizens voluntarily presented to the state a fleet of 200 men of war, carrying 60,000 troops. This new armada, sailing secretly, caught the Carthaginian fleet unprepared at the Egadian Isles off the west coast of Sicily, and so overwhelmed it that Carthage sued for peace in 241. Carthaginian Sicily was surrendered to Rome, an annual indemnity of 440 talents was pledged to Rome for ten years, and all Carthaginian restrictions on Roman trade were withdrawn. The war had lasted nearly 24 years and had brought Rome so near to bankruptcy that its currency was debased 83%. But it had proved the irresistible tenacity of the Roman character, and the superiority of an army composed of free men over mercenaries seeking the greatest booty for the least blood. Carthage was now to be all but destroyed by its own greed. It had withheld for some time the pay of its mercenaries, even of those who had served Hamilcar well. They poured into the city and demanded their money, and when the government temporized and tried to disperse them, they broke into mad revolt. Carthage's subject peoples, taxed beyond endurance during the war, joined the uprising, and the women of Libya sold their jewels to finance revolution. Twenty thousand mercenaries and rebels, led by Matho, a Libyan freeman, and Spendius, a Campanian slave, laid siege to Carthage at a time when hardly a soldier was there to defend it. 
The rich merchants trembled for their lives and appealed to Hamilcar to save them. Torn between affection for his mercenaries and his city, Hamilcar organized an army of 10,000 Carthaginians, trained them, led them forth, and raised the siege. The defeated mercenaries, retreating into the mountains, cut off the hands and feet of Jesco, a Carthaginian general, and 700 other prisoners, broke their legs, and then threw the still-living victims into an indiscriminate grave. Hamilcar maneuvered 40,000 of the rebels into a defile and blocked all exits so well that they began to starve. They ate their remaining captives, then their slaves. At last they sent Spendius to beg for peace. Hamilcar crucified Spendius and had hundreds of prisoners trampled to death under elephants' feet. The mercenaries tried to fight their way out but were cut to pieces. Matho was captured and was made to run through the streets of Carthage while the citizens beat him with thongs and tortured him till he died. This war of the mercenaries lasted forty months, from 241 to 237, and was by far, said Polybius, the most bloody and impious war in history. When the conflict was over, Carthage found that Rome had occupied Sardinia. Carthage protested and Rome declared war. The desperate Carthaginians bought peace only by paying Rome an additional 1,200 talents and surrendering Sardinia and Corsica. We may judge the fury of Hamilcar at this treatment of his country. He proposed to his government that it should provide him with troops and funds to re-establish the power of Carthage in Spain as a stepping stone to an attack upon Italy. The landowning aristocracy opposed the plan, fearing further war. The mercantile middle class, resenting the loss of their foreign markets and ports, supported it. As a compromise, Hamilcar was given a modest contingent, with which he crossed to Spain in 238. He recaptured the cities whose allegiance to Carthage had lapsed during the war, built up his army with native recruits, financed and equipped it with the products of Spain's mines, and died while leading a charge against a Spanish tribe. This in 229. He left behind him in the camp his son-in-law Hasdrubal, and his sons Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago, his lion's brood. The son-in-law was chosen commander and for eight years governed wisely, winning the cooperation of the Spaniards and building near the silver mines a great city, known to Rome as Nova Carthago, or New Carthage, the Cartagena of today. When he was assassinated in 221, the army elected as its leader Hamilcar's eldest son, Hannibal, then twenty-six years of age. Before leaving Carthage, his father had brought him, a boy of nine, to the altar of Baal Haman, and had bidden him swear that some day he would revenge his country against Rome. Hannibal swore and did not forget. 4. Hannibal Why had Rome permitted the reconquest of Spain? because she was harassed with class strife, was expanding in the Adriatic, and was at war with the Gauls. In 232, a tribune, Caius Flaminius, foreshadowed the Gracchi by carrying through the assembly, against the violent opposition of the Senate, a measure distributing among the poor citizens some lands recently won from the Gauls. In 230, Rome took her first step toward the conquest of Greece by clearing the Adriatic of pirates and seizing a part of the Illyrian coast as a further protection for Italian trade. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.